What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Facts on the Ground. I am Misty Winston, joined um, as per usual by my co-host Jesse Zerowell. Um, today, we are very excited to have uh, Rainer Shea on our show, who is a political commentator who's trying to agitate for a proletariat anti-colonial revolution in what is currently called the United States. Um, we're going to talk to him a little bit about a current article that he has out about um, United States foreign policy as it pertains to the similarities between places like Palestine and uh, uh, other places around the globe. So um, yeah, Rainer, thanks so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. See, what the analogy that I draw in this article between places like Palestine and places like Ukraine, Colombia, India is they're the result of a laboratory of destabilization and terrorism that the, the U.S. imperialists have been cultivating within Palestine. Israel is what I call a laboratory in necropolitics, where in order to meet the challenge, the perpetual challenge of keeping the Zionist state in existence amid all the obstacles arrayed against it, the imperialists have created a, a form of uh, state repression that can best be compared to quantum physics in that it's it's so incredibly thorough the movement the control over the movements of the people in Gaza and the the surveillance and the political repression and the restrictions on what Palestinians can eat and drink and so forth it's so incredibly invasive and such a violation of human rights uh that it's it's served as uh, an example for the policing and terror tactics of the other fascists around the world that Washington Washington imperialists back. Uh, perhaps the most direct example of this is Colombia, which Hugo Chavez called the Israel of Latin America. Colombia has uh, really taken example from Israel. Uh, in its policing tactics, uh, in its anti-indigenous tactics. It's been a real benefactor of Israeli military technologies, uh, as have been many other right-wing right -wing regimes in Latin America, especially. There's also the example of Ukraine, which has uh, this fascist terrorist organization, organization called the Azov Battalion, which has been receiving rifle shipments from Israel. Another parallel is Hindu nationalist India, uh, where the ruling BJP party, this is a Nazi inspired Indian party, has been colonizing Kashmir and uh, murdering many Muslims in the process of this. And both Israel and the Hindu nationalists, uh, as I've explained in my article, receive funding from the US-centered NGO industrial complex. So it's, it's a whole global network of colonial warfare uh, that's centered around the US and uh, finds an asset within Israel, which the Washington imperialists are using as, uh, as a center to innovate in their policing and terror tactics. Surveillance is also part of this. Yeah, I think one of the <clears throat> best parts or one of the most poignant parts or vital parts of your piece is that you make this global connection, this internationalist connection, which a lot of times is missing from foreign policy. So for example, if there's a discussion on Israel's genocide against Palestine, it tends to focus on Palestine instead of, instead of also bringing in, for example, the regime change attempts and operations you just mentioned. So I think that's a really important thing that we have to focus on as uh, people who are fighting against this type of terror and genocide is that it's an internationalist fight. And I'm glad that your piece brought that to light because we don't see that a lot anywhere. Aha, uh -huh, thanks. I mean, it's, it's a connection that uh, can't be drawn if you don't have a consciousness of what imperialism is, what imperialism means. <laughs> There's this, uh, there's this ideological uh, 
uh, process that the fascists with on all the locations I've mentioned use to legitimize their genocidal actions and to uh, to obfuscate the reality that they're they're really just uh, modern manifestations of the colonial war that the Euro-American imperialists have been carrying out for centuries. Uh, I mean, the countries like Israel, they uh, they try to create a sense of uh, of nationhood by uh, by putting forth these national symbols and uh, these uh, origin myths to, to justify their, uh, their existence. When really in, in the case of Israel, uh, see the thing about Israel is the Jewish nation is real, but the type of Jewish nation that they've created within Israel, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not exact, it's not Jewish supremacy, it's not, uh, just, it, it doesn't protect the Jews like uh, like the is like is the Israelis uh, claim their country to uh, to do because the dark skinned Jews within Israel are oppressed and the anti Semites actually share a goal with the Zionists in that uh, the anti Semites want to segregate Jews to Israel by isolating them to this specific space as part of their goal of a, a global apartheid. Uh, and it's no wonder that many Zionists are themselves anti-Semitic, and it's no wonder that, uh, that many Jews are uh, virulently anti-Zionist. Uh, there's another, uh, there's a parallel to this in Ukraine, which has created its own creation myths and nat national symbols to legitimize itself. What the Ukrainian nationalists have done following the 2014 Washington perpetrated coup that in installed a fascist government is they've been glorifying the Nazi collaborators who assisted Hitler with, uh, with carrying out the Holocaust within Ukraine. They've held up these figures as liberation fighters against communism. They've of, of course promoted the uh, Nazi fabricated uh, stories of supposed Soviet atrocities. Uh, and they've done this while carrying out repression against class struggle and persecuting jo Jews, Romanis, the LGBT community. So let me just, uh, sorry, Rainer, let me just push back right there against supposed Soviet atrocities. What do you mean by that, that nothing ever happened, that Lenin and Stalin didn't kill millions of people out of ideological paranoia? I'm talking about the Holodomor for, first and foremost. Right. I'm Ukrainian, yeah. so I know I, I understand what that is. And I am quite sure from all that I've read that it happened. Maybe the numbers have been exaggerated since what I've read, but it did happen. A famine happened, but it wasn't some engineered thing by Stalin. How so? Well, famines, look famines don't what? just usually don't just happen. They're usually they, they usually don't. they usually carried out systematically. They can happen organically, but in this case, I don't believe that, and I have to push back against that. From what I understand, it was a combination of natural factors combined with the ineptitude of Ukraine's uh, petty capitalist farmer class, the Kulaks, who got what they deserved, as they say. I don't know that anybody deserves to die, but... Well, they hoarded grain. They destroyed the resources. They hoarded the grain did. because they were starving to death because of collectivization and how pathetic a plan it was. The collectivization plan. Well, we, we can uh, we can expand upon this further. Perhaps when I get more sources related to this. But my my point is that the Ukrainian fascists. Let, let me let me just say though, I don't disagree with you about the present state of Ukraine. I have a disagreement with the historical point that we just touched upon. But I don't disagree with you about what's currently happening in Ukraine and the sort of reinvention of people like Stepan Bandera as national heroes. I don't disagree with that. It's just that historical point. And maybe we can have another conversation about that, which is totally cool. 
but yeah, I'm not trying to press you or, you know, make you, uh, you just have a disagreement. Make, it's make, fine. It se- make it seem like yeah. your argument is invalid. Yeah. I just have to. Yeah. We I, very I, much I, agree with your, your take on the current state of Ukraine. We've interviewed Moss Robson and, you know, gone through the entire, uh, issue that we're facing right now with Ukrainian diaspora and all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, I just think it's just, I mean, we could definitely touch on that more, but I mean, I don't know. I feel like that we can. Was, that's, that's just a sticking point for me. And I would feel remiss if I didn't bring it up, but we can continue. Let's continue the conversation we were having because that's another conversation we can have. And the creation miss that these types of, uh, elements put forth. As, uh, as I mentioned in my article, this, uh, this Moscow-based international affairs scholar, I don't remember his name, but he described what's happening in Ukraine as a nation-building project. Mark They're Svoboda. trying to create a sense, uh, perhaps you could say the illusion of social cohesion within Ukraine by, uh, by putting forth this uh, ultra-nationalist, patriotic narrative about the uni- the nation uh, having to rally around the supposed liberation fighters uh, who are act- in actuality Nazi-, Nazi collaborators. It's actually illegal to challenge this characterization of the Nazi collaborators as heroes. And they're doing everything they can to kill the people within Ukraine uh, who would very actively challenge this characterization. It's all part of a goal to uh, perpetuate warfare against Russia in the same way that they're trying to perpetuate warfare against Palestine. And there's another parallel to this in Colombia, uh, which is a place where some very disturbing things have been going on. Not Nazi elements have gained influence over the military and, and the police within Colombia. They've been waging scorched earth warfare, both against the revolutionary guerrillas and against the ordinary protesters. Massacres have been happening nightly. Protest leaders have been getting tracked down, executed, arrested. Uh, by the way, against the very constitutional principles of freedom of expression, that, uh, that Colombia's courts affirmed last year. Obviously in Colombia, the constitution means nothing in the face of the scorched earth class warfare, racist ideology that these Nazi elements have normalized within the functionings of governance there. And the way, to, the way that they've been justifying this campaign of atrocities is through a military doctrine that Colombia's former president, which I mentioned in the article, calls the dissipated molecular revolution. It's this- So interesting and such a weird title. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's this kind of, it seems kind of convoluted, kind of crackpotty theory, which calls for characterizing basically all factions of the left within Colombia as part of a broad reaching conspiracy that involves so-called Castro Chavismo and gender ideology, which is familiar to me in the United States, given all this, this culture war nonsense that the right here has been stirring up about it, gender ideology. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they're using this kind of nonsense conspiracy theories to manufacture consent, at least within the ranks of the armed forces there for a campaign of paramilitary, military, and police violence against all who oppose the government. This really reflects what uh, what Lenin wrote about in Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, where he was observing that the approach that the bourgeoisie internationally tend to have towards suppressing class revolt is by, uh, by hyperfixating on this idea that uh, there's this... Uh, the, this imminent, uh, there's this imminent wave of Bolshevik terror. Uh, they're viewing everything through the lens of violence and, uh, and treating 
all things communist as terroristic. As, and this reflects the counterterrorism doctrine that Colombia has taken up in coordination with Israel and with Washington. Yeah, and uh, perhaps you can go a little bit more into the figures behind what's happening in Colombia, because when I read your piece, that was a lot of that was news to me. And I knew the figures like uh, Uribe, for example, but I didn't know that they were this involved with a Zionist project imported to Colombia, so to speak. So can you talk about some of the people who've been behind that? Well, I don't, I don't remember very many of the names, but there's this uh, Israel to Colombia pipeline of, uh, of both ideological radical, radicalization in, in terms of racism, in terms of, uh, of a doctrine of state violence, and in terms of military technologies, as well as police training. There's this, uh, it's, it's, like a, it's like a triangle that's appeared between Washington and Israel and Colombia of, uh, of innovations in state violence. Because uh, remember that the, the Israelis have been training American police to the effect that marginalized groups within the US have been getting more violence enacted against them. And uh, I, I would call this a, an instance of the phenomenon imper anti-imperialists often point out of US imperialism's atrocities coming home. Because Zionism is ultimately uh, one of the many exports of imperialism. It's, it's uh, a Washington settler colonial project uh, that's, uh, that's tasked with setting up a military base within the Middle East for Washington. That's really all that Israel is for now. And, uh, and the effect of this is the cultivation of a laboratory in necropolitics where the IDF has been innovating new creative ways to brutalize Torture people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's one of the, that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on, because I think that this is a discussion that gets lost quite frequently is the links between, um, you know, the IDF and the United States police force and really just globally, the mechanisms of oppression um, all kind of come from center from the same place. Um, and I think that what kind of makes what Jesse was saying earlier, that this is really just an internationalist type of a thing that we all need to be worried about this. We're all fighting the same forces. That's why it's so heartening to me to see, um, you know, the Palestinian rights movement, um, you know, stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and vice versa. And there is, you, we're starting to see more and more of this global solidarity um, kind of across the globe. And I think that that's a lot to do with the fact that people are now more aware of how interconnected all of those things are. Um, so I don't know, maybe we can kind of just, uh, you know, riff on that and just talk about kind of the, how our, cause I don't think people really realize, I mean, in our circles, people know that the IDF trains our cops, but I don't think the average Joe on the street realizes that's what's happening. Um, and that in, in Palestine, in Gaza, they are uh, essentially using those people as, um, a method of experimentation on new weaponry that they can use and sell at a higher price because it's now been battle tested. Um, so it's all, you know, this kind of close clusterfuck of awfulness um, that I think a lot of people just don't talk about enough. Exactly. And the thing about this process of importing uh, Israeli colonialism's atrocities into the United States is as class warfare escalates within the United States, uh, it's going to get a lot worse. A lot more of the characteristics that we're seeing carried out within Gaza right now, where Israel has, has, has really been invading Gaza and bombing office buildings, slaughtering so many innocent people, characterizing them all as the Hamas, that's going to be brought into US borders as the class warfare escalates here. We, we've seen this uh, in the recent uh, Pentagon and U.S. Army War College documents that I've referenced in many of my articles that talk about plans 
to bring foreign U.S. warfare tactics into U.S. borders via occupying the largest U.S. urban centers in the event of destabilizing occurrences, such as uh, climatic catastrophes that knock out much of the U.S. power grid or hurricanes even larger than anything we've seen so far. These are the kinds of things that the U.S. military is preparing for. They want to be able to re retain control over these areas uh, when they get destabilized enough to warrant that kind of domestic occupation. And when these domestic U.S. military occupations are carried out, they're going to utilize the exact tactics that they've utilized within, uh, within Gaza that uh, the Washington proxy forces in the IDF have been using in Gaza. I mean, we've already seen some of that happening here yeah. in this country. I mean, anybody who's been to a protest recently can tell you that there are drones overhead and there, I mean, it's, it's really getting, um, a lot more intense than it's ever been before. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, we're seeing, and you can see the sabotage, the agent provocateur tactics that the police are trying to carry out, placing bricks along the routes of protesters, shooting protesters with unsealed rubber bullets. <clears throat> this is all part and parcel. This is Israel was doing this light years ago. The U.S. is just catching up now. That's usually how it works. They test everything out there and see what is effective and what works best. And then they bring it here. Um, once we're beaten down to the point where we don't want to fight back or we can't fight back or we're not paying attention enough to fight back or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that we're, I think you're definitely right. We're definitely seeing this stuff coming back home to roost. I don't think anybody would be, anybody who's paying attention should, should not be surprised by that. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, I don't, it's frustrating that more people aren't paying attention to it, um, being that it is so kind of blatant and in our faces, especially recently. I mean, we've seen, and I mean, now that we're, we're seeing Israeli strikes on uh, media buildings, um, it doesn't surprise me in any way, shape, form, or fashion, because that's always been the method of control of the narrative for these people. They, that they attack the media first. Um, we're seeing that in the United States. We're seeing the attacks on journalists. We're seeing that they're being photographed and um, their names are being entered into an app so that they can be tracked and um, they're being arrested, detained, pepper sprayed, beaten up. Um, you know, it, it, that's another thing that we're kind of mirroring uh, what Israel is doing is the attacks on media. Yes, yes. And I, I was saying that it's not like there's not precedent for these kinds of tactics being taken into the U.S. In 1985, the Philadelphia police bombed an entire neighborhood just to snuff out a Black liberation group. That was the move bombing. Yes, the move bombing. And I, I, I feel like in the coming decades, there's going to be a repeat of this. Uh, the U.S. government is likely going to be doing this left and right, uh, especially if the liberation groups, class liberation groups, national liberation groups in this country uh, start to mobilize towards, uh, towards armed resistance to the U.S. government. Uh, but the, the thing about that is if the U.S. government escalates things to that level, it's going to turn a lot of people against the government. It's going to de delegitimize the U.S. government's image as, uh, as the state that, sh that should morally rule over this population. I mean, th this is what the Indian government fears will happen if it uh, tries to go scorched earth and uh, in an, its efforts to snuff out the communist guerrilla fighters over there. I recently read a foreignpolicy.com article uh, about how the Indian government fears going too far in its uh, military tactics against the communist guerrillas there, because if it does, it's going to uh, destroy the military's image as a, as a defensive force. The people are going to see it as a hostile invading presence. And that's also, as the article says, likely going to cause fissures within the military itself, as uh, a lot of the soldiers 
find it morally distasteful to kill their own people. Mm-hmm. And that's the only reason why we haven't seen that sort of a thing done in the United States so far. Um, it's all about optics. And once they've manufactured enough consent for that kind of behavior, um, they will absolutely, you're right, we will see a repeat of the move bombing or something similar. Um, you know, we, I talk about it all the time, we've been systematically handing over our First Amendment rights for decades now. Um, but it's really been over the past 10 or 15 years that it's really ramped up. And that's, I mean, we're just, we're seeing that across the board. It, it's just little by li- little, by little they're chipping away at it um, until they can manuf- manufacture the kind of consent that they need to do what they're doing to Julian Assange or to do what they're doing to journalists who are trying to cover protests across the country right now. Um, we're friends with a lot of independent journalists who do on the ground work at protests and they are getting their asses kicked by cops. They're very clearly marked as press and they're getting shot at with rubber bullets and they're you know, getting beat up, pushed over, detained, hit. Um, you know, run over all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that's it. Everybody should be uh, very wary of what's coming. Um, it's only going to continue to get worse. Yeah. Really. And especially since it's so-called local police who are doing this, it was the Philadelphia police who manned the helicopter that dropped the bomb on the move house on Osage Avenue in Philadelphia, in West Philadelphia. It wasn't anything to do with the federal forces were involved, but it wasn't their helicopter. It was a police helicopter. And that should bring fear to anybody that just local police, municipal police. I mean, this was 1985, as you said, Rainer. Look, we're here in 2021. Who knows what they have now? I mean, we've seen the SUVs in New York just plowing into protesters. The rubber bullets, as we mentioned They're trying earlier. to make that stuff legal, too, by the way. The anti-protest bills, some of those bills include giving immunity to people in motor vehicles who run over protesters. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm just a long way of making a long, <clears throat> trying to make the point in a long way, I suppose, that it's the local police we have to fear as well, because they are, they have just as much of an arsenal um or maybe a little less, but uh, to destroy us, to come at us and try to destroy us. And it doesn't have to be uh, necessarily that they're getting weapons from the defense department. You know, they have their own sort of. Well, I mean, that's where they're getting them from. And I mean, Mo- we talked to Danny Scherzen. They usually yeah. have better equipment. Than people I don't, in know, the that was hap- military I don't do. know that was that, that was happening in 85, but. No, I'm yeah. just saying now. Bring it back now. Yeah, just trying to bring it to the point that the police are hyper militarized right now. And they were willing to bomb a house uh, that had children in it in 1985. So I don't think they have any holds barred at this point. No, right. Cops right. Do as they're told. Well, you know. Biden is uh, accelerating the process of military aid going to U.S. police departments. And uh, Biden also recently gave, I I think this was in February, he gave ICE more authority to detain people for so-called national security reasons. This makes up the network of secret prisons that the United States is creating in the form of the ICE detention facilities. Uh, which is where activists and journalists have uh, been thrown in the mix of people who've been put into these inhumane, torturous detention centers. This is how uh, this is how dictatorial regimes build secret prisons by uh, by perpetually uh, chipping away at the uh, established norms and expectations for how prisoners should be treated and who should be arrested. It, it's more and more getting vague. Who can be, be arrested and what can be done to them? So ICE is really an extension of the Guantanamo uh, detention center, and just as the uh, war on terror is a preparation for the kinds of tactics that the US military is going to carry out against the American people. This is all a preparation for an internal war that's going to be waged against those within U.S. borders. And it's ultimately going to include all of the tactics that are being uh, being enacted against the Palestinians right now with the cutting off of resources, 
the, the random slaughtering of civilians. And as this war is carried out, the narrative aspect is going to be important. We, we see the uh, constant uh, portrayal of all facets of Palestinian society as the Hamas, the Hamas says, the Hamas did that, uh, which is pretty absurd, but it's, uh, it's plausible for someone who's bought into the Zionist imperialist ideology. Which is hard to not do in this country, given that you are propagandized um, consistently and constantly. It's inescapable that Israel is, um, you're not allowed to criticize Israel. You're not allowed, you know what I mean? It, it, they're all, everything's yeah. fine and great and good. Um, but what do you make of the fact that we have leftists uh, cheering on this kind of authoritarianism and this kind of surveillance state and uh, kind of police militarization and all of those things. We just had progressives completely drop the ball on uh, the Capitol Police bill. Um, we have people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, Bernie Sanders cheering on the deplatforming of people that they don't like. Um, finally, it took Bernie Sanders months and months and months for him to say that it was maybe a bad idea to take the president of the United States off of the internet entirely. Well, um, I, lo I lost my account for a few days because I made a joke about AOC. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's um, to me, that's one of the most disturbing aspects, because I've always um, thought of these issues as being leftist issues, solidly leftist issues where people who consider themselves on the left should care about, should be fighting against them. Um, and that's not what we have at all. I mean, we have politicians sending out mass emails to their, you know, stands um, asking them to go report people on Twitter for making, you know, tweets that they don't like. So what do you make of that, Rainer? I mean, just, just looking at it uh, uh, from your perspective. Well, the, the thing about deplatforming is that it, even though it's, uh, it's, it's gone a long way towards uh, diminishing the reach of some of the most dangerous voices uh, within U.S. political discourse, it's, uh, it's ultimately helped the right by giving it a sense of, uh, of perceived legitimacy and, uh, and propaganda power. Because uh, the, the situation with QAnon and the radicalization of the right within the United States is, uh, is, is so, it's so weird because on the one hand, the US intelligence community has been, uh, been uh, helping facilitate these kinds of censorship measures, these kinds of precedents set for, uh, for who can get uh, get deplatformed? But the, on the other hand, I think there's good evidence that the U.S. intelligence community has been trying to foster the radical elements within the U.S. right uh, sure. that has led to this kind of violence. I, I, I'm pretty sure QAnon is a CIA. It's a psyop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no question. No question. It's obvious. It couldn't be more obvious. One of the most recent bills or resolutions that AOC sponsored was to condemn QAnon as oh. some sort of conspiracy entity. You can go on votesmart.com and find that. It's <laughs> pretty comedic. That is pretty funny. And then today, Bernie Sanders said that we need to tone down our rhetoric about Israel because it can fuel anti-Semitic attacks. Bernie Sanders uh, needs to tone down his career and end it. He does. He really does. He's just unbelievably disappointing. Um, yeah, but that's just to me, it's been really frustrating to watch people on the left cheer on things like uh, deplatforming and censorship. And because it's not like we don't know where this goes it, every time it's used against dissent. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, they're, they're going to obviously go after the Alex Jones types first because they're the most um, universally reviled people. And so it's very easy for everybody to be like yeah fuck him I mean, that guy's an asshole um but the truth is is that it always comes back to uh you know censoring people like a max blumenthal or you know a venezuela analysis or whatever you know it, that's where it always goes and it's very frustrating to watch people who should know better cheering on something that will ultimately eat against them um and it's not like we don't know that that's going to happen so it just makes it very frustrating for me to watch yeah right uh, Oh, go ahead, Rainer. No, you, you say something. Well, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. I just wanted to, uh, I suppose, point out something first that I think it's interesting 
in your piece how you provide the history of the U.S. as sort of a template for this neocolonialism that we're seeing with Israel right now, um, but also, as you mentioned, Colombia and India, but also how the U.S. has sort of fallen behind, even though it's set the template, if that makes sense, because uh, as we just mentioned, it's sort of catching up to Israel now in the experimentation of weapons and uh, the the even just the reception of weapons from not just the State Department or the Defense Department, but uh, foreign entities. Um, so I think that's interesting that the U.S. Has, sent, has set the template or did and is kind of in the back seat now. Um, but also one of the entities you represent, uh, you reference uh, with regard to what's happening in Palestine now is the Gulf monarchies. And I don't think that gets touched on a lot. So we're talking about the UAE and other uh, supposed kingdoms. Can you talk about that a bit and, and the role they play in the genocide against Palestinians? Well, uh, there's this there's this bizarre development that I, I researched about a couple months ago where these Gulf monarchies started importing the Zionist censorship and propaganda tactics uh, to try to further their own social control. And it's, it's so bizarre because Israel is an extremely anti-Arab racist state. Uh, and, and now we see the Gulf monarchies importing this uh, these very same tactics to further their uh, their authoritarian grip under the guise of off, uh, normalization with Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's there's also this co coordination that uh, Israel has been uh, having with Saudi Arabia. I know this doesn't have to do with Palestinians. Maybe you could expand on that point. But Israel has been coordinating with coordinating with. Saudi Arabia, uh, in that as the Saudis and the the U.S. have destabilized, waged war against uh, Yemeni society, Israel has been setting up uh, little settler colonies and military footholds within Yemen, uh, which is something that has alarmed Yemenis, and I, I see that as an attempt by the Israelis to start to fulfill their longer term plans what was called the Yinan plan of uh, taking imperial control over uh, Southwest Asia more broadly. Because the, the thing about Israel is it's probably not going to survive to 100. It's in a, a, a very dangerous uh, situation that it's put itself in, trying to perpetually aggress against all the nations that surround it. Uh, and it, it's not even a legitimate state because it's settler colonial. So the only way for Israel well, to... Doesn't, it doesn't have an eastern border. Yeah, yeah. The only way for Israel to survive in the long term would be for it to gain so much land that it no longer has these nations rivaling it, which is what the United States did to gain the amount of stability that it, it has now. Following the establishment of the original... 13 colonies, which kind of parallel the uh, establishment of the Israeli settler colonial strip that exists now, the United States annexed uh, the rest of the uh, American continent, what was rightly called Turtle Island, and they, uh, they only let the natives have a little bit of land, and even then they, uh, they sabotage the communistic societies of the natives so that they could turn these tribes into U.S. neo-colonies for, uh, for U.S. capital. This is what the Israelis ultimately want to do or do the equivalent of throughout the region that the imperialists have labeled the Middle East. They want to subdue Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, all of these countries uh, so that they can uh, so that the Israelis can elevate themselves to the status of an imperial power. And how much of this do you think, or would you say, has to do with land and resource extraction as opposed to religious ideology? Oh, <laughs> religious ideology is just a way of rationalizing 
the extraction, the exploitation. The same was the case in the United States, where a kind of proto-Zionism helped rationalize the annexation of uh, the land, particularly in Utah, where this the American exceptionalist cult of Mormonism, uh, they, they cultivated a, a kind of proto-Zionist ideology that rationalized uh, creating this, uh, this new white supremacist uh, nation within, uh, within the middle lands of the American continent uh, under the rationale of fulfilling some biblical criteria. And that's, what's rational, that's what rationalizes the current colonization of Palestine. Evangelical Christians support Israel because they <laughs> paradoxically want to see Israel destroyed during the end times. The, the, this is not a worldview that's based in logic and reason. It's, it's, it's pure emotionally driven and, uh, and based off of some old scripts that they say means there's a mandate to colonize this part of the world so that God can use it as a launching pad for his end times holy war and G that's where jesus will come back and lift up the saved right but if you're if you're not if you're jewish and you ref refuse to convert to christianity you're not going to be saved so that's the rub yeah. right there <laughs> none of this stuff makes any sense i actually it's just tweeted ridiculous. about this right before we got on because uh cufi christians united for israel put something out they've been putting out stuff uh non-stop by zionist politicians in the u.s <laughs> Israel has the right to exist. Israel has the right to defend itself, et cetera, et cetera. The same shit we hear nonstop anytime Israel starts slaughtering Palestinians. So, um, yeah, it's important to uh, highlight the point that the Christians uh, united for Israel, the Christian Zionists are a huge force behind perpetuating what we're seeing happening, what we've seen happen. And I forget who said it, but if you go by numbers, if you go by membership numbers, at least, the Christian Zionist lobby is the largest lobby in the United States, the largest political lobby. So that says something as well as to why all of this is able to keep going on and how the U.S. can just green light it over and over and over. Yes, and I think it should be said too, again, which I know nobody watching this will be surprised, but the the lobbying is um, an unbelievable problem in this country. Um, Israel essentially owns our government, every government official, I mean, at least federally for sure. Um, really even... <laughs> It's really across the board. Um, you know, you even have people like a Tulsi Gabbard who claims to be, you know, anti-regime change war, whatever, whatever, 100% Zionist. Bernie Sanders, 100% Zionist. I mean, even the squad that, you know, proclaims to be for Palestinian rights, sometimes when it's convenient for them, um, they still are very wishy-washy and very... Um, I mean, they're very quick to turn their backs on Palestinians when it really, when, when, when it really gets into it. Um, you know, they'll occasionally come out with, you know, as they usually do, a dramatic speech or a snarky tweet or something. Um, but it, what it really comes down to it, when it comes down to voting to send Israel more money, they don't care. They don't care. No, they don't care. They don't and, care. And, no. and they don't care outside of that either. If they really cared, they wouldn't be, as you say, wishing. They care as far as the tweet will help them get reelected. That's right. really all they care about. So they don't, which means they don't care about Palestinians at all. No, <laughs> no, just as, just, just as a uh, political football that they can use to a reelection football that they can use to, um, you know, get their woke points when they need them. Um, right, right. But yeah, that's another thing that's extremely depressing to me is watching the, you know, the quote unquote left and electoral politics in this country um, be completely imperialist um, and, uh, you know, coup supporting fireworks and eagles, Amer American exceptionalist pigs, and it sucks. Uh, the anti-war movement has really effectively been killed off in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, that's, that, that introduces another facet of this whole, uh, this whole issue, especially when it comes to fascism, because uh, saying Israel owns our government is one way to put it, but uh, I, I think a better way to put it is by observing that Israel is 
uh, deeply partnered, fundamentally partnered with the U.S. government because Israel was put there by the U.S. government. I mean, as, as Joe Biden has said, if there weren't an Israel there, we would have to invent an Israel to preserve our interests. Uh, so Israel and that was back is, in 1986. So who knows yeah, it, how far he's gone since then. Uh-huh. And Israel is... Uh, basically an attack dog of Washington, though it, it, it can assert its independence in some facets, like when it comes to relations with China. And the thing about U.S.-Israel relations is the whole uh, issue of Zionism, the whole opposition to Zionism, the Nazis are trying to hijack this uh, with narratives about a Zionist occupied government. And when they, they put forth the idea of a Zionist occupied government, they're going by the assumption that firstly, the United States government is legitimate and that it belongs to the white people and that the Jews have, uh, have somehow hijacked this. So we need to kick out the Jews. We need to persecute the Jews. That's the implication of the Zog narrative, uh, which I, 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 that's such a, uh, a cynical ploy that they're using. They're trying to hijack the anti-Zionist movement, and more broadly, the fascists are trying to hijack the anti-war movement. Because people like Alex Jones, they're anti—they're—they're they're pretty anti-war. But what's their motivation? Their goal is not to uh, liberate the oppressed nations or to develop towards socialism. It's to create a fascist state that uh, that puts forth isolationism as uh, a central tenet so that it can, so that America, America can free itself from the globalists. That's the, uh, the go-to word that they, they use, not capitalism, but globalism, which is obviously a euphemism for Jews. Uh, I, I find it so interesting how the fascists have been trying to hijack language and narratives in these ways. I also, I also <clears throat> would add to the stigma against the term globalism that for those who are against it it has to do with sort of an a dissolution of capitalism and individualism in that you, now you have to cooperate with other countries and other people around the world and it's not the just the isolated united states and its western allies with their so-called open markets operating it means that you possibly have to do business with China or India or God forbid Russia. Right. Mm. So that's, I think uh, just something I wanted to, to piggyback onto what you were saying as, as pertains the, the stigma toward globalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more like a neutral, it, it should ultimately be viewed as something neutral, not necessarily bad the way that the uh, imperialists use it is as a rationale for imposing austerity and privatization and wage cuts onto countries, which has, has been really ramping up in this last year as the IMF has imposed these kinds of measures onto 81 countries. This is what they've done to take advantage of the pandemic. Can you talk about that more? Because I don't really know much about that. I know the IMF is a, an insidious entity, but can you talk about what they've done, what you just mentioned? Well, I, I, I heard about this like half a year or so ago. So basically all I know is the IMF last year uh, put forth a plan to carry out the cutting of wages, the cutting of social services, the privatization of more resources within 81 countries. That was the number. Uh, and I, I don't know, the situation might have changed in Bolivia because since then, the socialists have gotten back into power over there. And that's, I, I think, the beginning, that's the, uh, the light on the horizon, the little a, a big glimmer of hope that we've seen in this last year is the liberation of, of Bolivia following the 2019 CIA coup. And the imperialists may be gaining ground literally in Colombia from the revolutionaries, and they may have sabotaged successfully the anti-IMF candidate in Ecuador last month. 
but in the long term, more liberations like the one we, we just saw in Bolivia are going to happen. The proletariat, the, the, the peasant classes, the oppressed nationalities around the world, they're going to start carrying out a new wave of socialist revolutions. This wave is going to begin within the global south, the neo-colonies, the exploited countries, but ultimately it's going to spread into the core imperialist countries, which in the case of the United States, after the revolution comes here, the United States isn't going to exist anymore. It's going to turn into a post-colonial paradigm should the revolution succeed, it'll, it'll tr turn into a paradigm where the uh, the hundreds of indigenous First Nations that got, got their land stolen will regain full jurisdiction over this land so that socialism can develop within these nations. And I think the IMF stuff is just really very indicative of the Great Reset. I mean, just go talk to Klaus Schwab. He doesn't, he, you're going to eat bugs and like it, Jesse. You're going to like it. You're going to well, own nothing. I need Steve here to do the accent because I can't do it. He does a great Klaus Schwab. How many, how many spiders on average does a person swallow while they're sleeping? They say it's eight, but I think that's an old wives tale. I don't know. I don't know if that's like an accurate thing anymore. I remember well, seeing something that it was debunked, but I like yeah, all but, eight of them. Yeah. Well, I, I like to say that um, Klaus Schwab, in, instead of a guillotine, we need to just feed him to the bugs. Turn that shit around on him. Um, but Who yeah, the IMF stuff, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum. Oh, I don't know okay. who he is. Creepy dude. He's a creepy dude. Like yeah. that's legit evil. He's a legitimately evil person. He really does want you to just eat bugs and like it. Well, uh, where, did, where did Paul Wolfowitz go cool his heels after he was done with the Bush administration and helping to destroy the sovereign country of Iraq? He went to the IMF, mm -hmm. I believe, if I'm not it's mistaken. It's a circle jerk of corruption, and I'm then telling he, you. And then he was essentially fired, although I'm sure he'll say he resigned because of some kind of um, wrongdoing on his part. But, you know, that's all he ever had to pay for was what he did at the IMF, not destroying, committing the, the supreme war crime of a war of aggression. Yeah, no, they don't ever have to pay for that, dude, ever. They never have to pay for that. Um, yeah, okay. It's always so much fun to talk about this stuff, you guys. It's really just so. Yeah, I know we, we don't want to keep you too long, Rainer, and uh, we'll get to wrapping up. But one of the things you mentioned in your piece that I've always been interested in, and I really have a dearth of knowledge when it comes to it, is Kashmir. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. I mean, not give like a comprehensive history, but just what's happening, what's been happening there and how that ties into what we've been talking about. And maybe even Myanmar as well, because that's been in the news, but we don't really hear about that. Uh, well, what I, I know about Kashmir is it's been a, a victim of Indian colonialism. And throughout these last couple of years, India has been cutting off the internet for long stretches of time, which is a uh, is probably another one of those warfare tactics that the United States government is going to use when it starts trying to snuff out a serious class warfare effort in the United States. But in, anyway, part of this colonization cash of Kashmir project has been the perpetual escalation of violence against Muslims. There's this state sanctioned campaign of terror against Muslims where Hindutva fascists Hindu nationalists are killing random Muslims, especially the most vulnerable Muslims they can find. I've kept seeing in my Facebook feed Indian communists uh, lamenting the murders of Muslim children who were who've been murdered at the with the, with the complicity of the Modi government. Uh, and there, there's lots of parallels between the early stages of the Holocaust and the situation in India with the Muslims. Uh, and as for Myanmar, this is actually another branch of the how the US, uh, what was what it, the NGO industrial complex in the US has been funding these kinds of genocides against Muslims. Because in addition to the NGO funding uh, for the defense of these uh, genocidal Hindu nationalists in India, the NGOs have been uh, 
funding prior to uh, to this the coup this year, the genocide of uh, of Muslims within Myanmar, uh, all under the guise of humanitarianism. Though I I, I don't know if what I just said is ac accurate entirely because. Do you know if a genocide is still going on against Muslims in Myanmar? I can't say for certain because every time I read something or I see a headline, which has mostly been in the mainstream press lately, um, because I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to dive as deeply as I usually do uh, as of late. But it's so convoluted the details, so I can't say for sure whether it's considered a genocide or i'm sure there are some calling for that but strictly for political reasons yeah and i'm because... unfamiliar with the current state of things there it's not something i've been admittedly I, i've not been following that me yeah. neither um, yeah well i think it's something we should that is we should interesting we should on, look into uh, that pay attention to yeah yeah we should maybe find somebody to talk to about that that would be an interesting show yeah so i I think it's a, a really great piece you wrote. Uh, I think the connections you make internationally are so important. And for the work that all three of us are trying to do, it's so important to understand these connections. And I suppose my final question would be, what do you say to people who would read this and say, I mean, it's very, it's very well sourced. I looked at all the sources and, but there are people who are inevitably going to say, well, this is, this is not what's going on. This is crazy. I haven't seen anything about this. I haven't heard anything about this. What would you say to them or what would you encourage them to do to maybe dispel um, that myth for themselves? Well, you, you refer to a lot of myths. So uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly which myths you are referring to, but it sounds like you're referring to the more broadly uh, more broadly, uh, nation building myths when it comes to Israel or the post 2014 Ukraine, which uh, paints these nation states as legitimate. And uh, they, they try to legitimize the US aid to places like Ukraine and Israel by saying that they're, they're fighting for their lives, they're uh, defending against Russian aggression or against Hamas. Uh, and when it comes to Israel, well, that, that's, a, that's a deeply ingrained ideological bias that a lot of Americans have, uh, where they're, a lot of them are programmed to uh, hate Palestinians because they're programmed to hate Muslims post 9-11, uh, so they don't care what happens to the Palestinians. And when it comes to Ukraine, that, that's a that's a, an even more interesting uh, ideological development because most people aren't on board with the idea of uh, pogroms and ethnic cleansing and political persecution as has been happening in Ukraine unless they're tricked into it. Uh, and this, this goes back to the fundamental roots of the rationale that the Ukrainian nationalists are using for their atrocities, which is anti-communism and Russophobia. They, they paint the founders of Ukraine as heroes because they resisted uh, communism and Russia. And, uh, and they're, they're hoping for people to get on board with this due to their, uh, their already existing biases against communism and against Russia. And th this is something I recently saw a parallel to in this clip from former Trump advisor, Sebastian Gorka, who said this last week that, uh, that my father resisted a communist takeover of, uh, of Hungary mm -hmm. and until he was, uh, he was imprisoned by the new communist government there. He was liberated six years later by the, uh, the heroic liberation fighters in the uh, 1956 uh, Hungarian Revolution. Out of context, that sounds like a downing condemnation of communism, but actually Gorka's father fought for the preservation of a dictatorship that had assisted Hitler in killing 400,000 Jews 
within Hungary, parallel to how the Ukrainian regime assisted Hitler with the Holocaust there. Uh, so th these were the kinds of sentiments that uh, are at the root of a lot of the modern apologia for fascism, which is rationalizing fascism back then. Yes, yeah. and I think that brings it all back to propaganda. It's really mm -hmm. the way things are sold to people and the narrative management and the way that it's, I mean, in this country, it, again, it, you're all, you, you're programmed to support Israel. And a lot of people you'll say, do you support Israel? Yes. Well, why do you support Israel? They don't know. <laughs> They don't right. know why we send them a bunch of money. They don't know why we um, have this like weird um, undying allegiance where we will literally put Israel before the needs of our own country. We're sending them, you know, billions of dollars. Um, they have med they have universal health care. We do not. But people don't question that because they've been kind of programmed to think that that's normal, that's acceptable. Um, and so that kind of stuff is, is, is just normalized through propaganda. And I think that's a huge part of it is just learning how to recognize the propaganda. Yeah, and we, we should also add that the siege, the genocidal siege on Gaza is is being aided and abetted by Egypt as well. Uh, yes. They often get left out, but they Palestinians do. are rarely, if ever, allowed to uh, use the Rafah crossing into Egypt or back into Gaza. So there's that, and we ought not to forget about that. Yes, that is a very good point. Well, Rainer, thank you so much for coming on. I'm sorry I was a little distracted. My kid, like I have a kid yelling. I don't know if you guys can hear. I have a kid yelling. I have another kid texting me that she's sick. So I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted right now. Um, oh, but good. thanks for coming on. Do you want to tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find your work and everything so everybody can keep up with what you're doing? I have a website, rainershade.com, R-A-R, -E let me start over, R-A-I-N-E-R-S-H-E-A.com. I'm also on the blogging platform Medium, though I'll probably be taken off of it again sometime for my controversial takes. <laughs> Welcome happens. to the club. <laughs> <laughs> that happens when you're doing important work, I think. So keep yeah. that shit up. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate it. We'd love to have you back sometime to further the conversation. Um, and thanks everybody for watching and we will catch you next time. Thanks, Randy. Yes.